Hello and welcome to Scriptures Unlocked. This presentation will be a very important one. We'll be examining the sixth feast of Jehovah, which is the Day of Atonement. This feast is very significant because it shows and outlines the way that God has been dealing with the sin problem. So the Day of Atonement is what we'll be looking at in this presentation. We'll be looking at various scriptures. So every point that will be made will be supported by scriptures and scripture alone. Because I believe in sola scriptura. So everything that I will say, and you'll see it for yourself, will be backed up by scripture. As I seek to show the importance of the Day of Atonement and how Jesus Christ is fulfilling this particular feast currently as we speak. So this presentation is entitled The Day of Atonement. Of all the Jewish festivals, the Day of Atonement was the most solemn. The Hebrew name for the Day of Atonement is Yom Kippur, which literally means Day of Covering. It was the only day in the entire year when all the sins of the nation of Israel would be covered. Hence, it was called the Day of Atonement. It was essentially a day of judgment and cleansing of the sanctuary. The Day of Atonement occurred nine days after the blowing of the shofar on the Feast of Trumpets, which we discussed in the previous presentation. And central to this day was the high priest, two goats, and a face-to-face -face meeting with God. This is what we are told in scripture about the Day of Atonement, and this can be found in Leviticus 23, verses 26 to 31. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Also, on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a Day of Atonement. So there we can see that the Day of Atonement occurred on the tenth day of the seventh month. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto Jehovah. And ye shall do no work in that same day. Why? For it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before Jehovah your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted, in that same day he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. And God again repeats, Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. And this is where we get the time period from when the Sabbath begins. God tells them from even unto even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. So the Sabbath occurs at even when the sun sets on Friday and ends on even when the sun sets on Saturday. So these verses point out the seriousness and solemnity of the Day of Atonement. No work was to be done since it was a day devoted entirely for the putting away of sin. Persons were to be in a penitent and reflective mood. This was not a day to be apathetic, casual, or irreverent. To display such an attitude would certainly lead to that individual's death. The entire chapter of Leviticus 16 is dedicated to the Day of Atonement. So let's examine the events which took place on Yom Kippur and then point out the significance of this penultimate feast to Jesus. This is what we are told and we'll spend our entire time in the book of Leviticus chapter 16 which speaks about the Day of Atonement and then we'll proceed from there to make the link and show how Jesus Christ is fulfilling this particular day that took place yearly in Israel. Leviticus 16 verse 1 says this, The law of atonement. And Jehovah spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, and those sons were Nadab and Abihu, when they offered before Jehovah and died. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come, not at all times, into the holy place within the veil, before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that ye die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So there are some very important points to be made from these verses as it relates to the Day of Atonement. 1. The high priest was the only person permitted to enter the most holy place of the sanctuary. And that is where God's presence dwelt. Two, 
the high priest could not enter into God's presence anytime he wanted. Three, the high priest could enter behind the veil only once per year on the 10th day of the seventh month, which is the day of atonement, which we are studying in this presentation. And here's a picture of the sanctuary. So here you're seeing the high priest. This section is the holy place where you have the table of shoebread, the seven branch candlestick and the altar of incense. It was separated by a veil. And then on the day of atonement, the high priest was only permitted to enter this chamber, the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place where the presence of God dwelt between the cherubim. So this is a, the section that God was telling Moses to tell Aaron that he should not come at all times in the most holy place. So throughout the year, the high priest would enter the sanctuary and he would minister in this section of the holy place. He will tend to the seven branch candlestick. They will change the shoe bread on Sabbaths so that they are fresh bread on the table every Sabbath and he would offer prayers on behalf of the people at the altar of incense. But on the day of atonement, this was when, this was the only day when the high priest was allowed to enter into the most holy place. On the day of atonement, viewers, the high priest had to make meticulous preparation before going behind the veil, which I just showed you. And this is what God instructed the high priest to do. Leviticus 16 verse 4 says this, He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. And notice the emphasis is on linen because linen was a white fabric that represents the righteousness of the saints. So the, the high priest had to be dressed holy in linen. And verse 5 says this, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So here you are seeing two goats were chosen for the day of atonement. Leviticus 16 verse 6 says, and Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. So the high priest had to first make atonement for himself and his household before he could minister in God's presence on behalf of the people. And verse 7 says this, And he shall take the two goats and present them before Jehovah at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for Jehovah, and the other lot for the scapegoat. So lots were cast to determine which goat would be for Jehovah and which would be Azazel. The Hebrew word translated as scapegoat in verse 8. And here you can see the Hebrew script for scapegoat. It is the Hebrew word Azazel. And here you are seeing on screen that Azazel occurs four times in the Hebrew scriptures and it is translated as scapegoat in all four instances it simply means the entire removal it's actually the goat of departure scapegoat viewers is actually a poor translation of the hebrew word the hebrew word azazel is derived from two root words azal which means to go away and ez which means goat therefore azazel really means goat of departure or goat sent away scapegoat can be defined as a person who is made to bear unmerited blame for others and made to suffer in their stead. In other words, a scapegoat is someone who is blamed and punished for another's action. And the scapegoat viewers is always innocent. That must be made clear. Therefore, Jehovah's goat is the scapegoat and not Azazel, as the King James versions have translated it. So Jehovah's goat is indeed the scapegoat and not Azazel. Since Jehovah's goat was sacrificed as a sin offering, while Azazel was presented alive, which precludes Azazel from being the scapegoat. And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 tells us this, For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin. So Jesus was innocent, but Jesus took our sins upon himself. He bore our sins, and he was sacrificed as a sin offering. For the sins of humanity. This is why when John the Baptist saw Jesus. 
He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus Christ is our scapegoat. He took our blame. He took our sins upon himself. He was innocent. He knew no sin. Jesus was sinless. He was a sinless Lamb of God. But as a scapegoat, he took the blame for our sins. The blame for our sins were placed upon him. And that is why in Isaiah 53, it says he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. So Jesus Christ is the scapegoat, not Azazel. And that point must be made very clearly. Notice Leviticus 16, verse 9 and 10. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which Jehovah's lot fell, which is Jehovah's goat, and offer him for a sin offering. But, notice the difference, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, or Azazel, shall be presented alive before Jehovah to make an atonement with him, that's Jehovah's goat, and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Jehovah's goat, which was sacrificed, signifies Jesus' death as an atonement for the sins of humanity, while Azazel represents Satan. This point should be noted. Jesus Christ represents Jehovah's goat, while Azazel represents Satan. Notice what we are also told by God concerning atonement. Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So it is the blood of the slain goat, Jehovah's goat, that was used to make an atonement, never the live goat. Notice what we are told in Leviticus 16, verse 11 onwards. And Aaron, who is the high priest, shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before Jehovah. And his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before Jehovah, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. Simply because the most holy place of the sanctuary is also known as the secret place of the Most High. God dwelt between the cherubim in the Shekinah glory. So when the high priest went into the most holy place, he had to bring the incense and the cloud of the incense would cover the mercy seat and shield the presence of God from the eyes of Aaron so that Aaron would not die. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger how many times? Seven times. Because it's a full atonement. Seven is the number of completion. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And here you are seeing a picture of the high priest dressed in linen, with a mitre, linen mitre upon his head. He is there before the mercy seat, where the two cherubim are, and he is sprinkling, he has a censer there on the ground, and he is sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat, eastward. So that is what the high priest had to do on the day of atonement as he made atonement for the people and he was cleansing the sanctuary of their sins. So before going behind the veil, the high priest had to bring incense, the blood of the bullock, which was for himself, and the blood of the goat, Jehovah's goat, for the people, then sprinkle the blood on and before the mercy seat. If the high priest failed to follow these guidelines when he entered into the secret place of the Most High, he would die because it is the blood of the sacrifice that makes atonement for his soul. Again, viewers, it was the slain goat's blood that made an atonement. And notice what we are told in Leviticus 16, verse 15 onwards. Then shall he kill the goat, that's a high priest, of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. Notice the plurality. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. 
And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he cometh out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before Jehovah and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it because the day of atonement is about cleansing the sanctuary of sin and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So viewers, Jehovah's goat was sacrificed and his blood was used to cleanse the sanctuary of the sins of the children of Israel. So what normally happens during the sanctuary service? Every day when persons committed sin, they would bring an, they would bring an animal. They would put their hands upon the head of the animal confess their sins upon the animal, thus symbolically transferring their sins to the innocent animal. The sinner would then cut the throat of the animal who will die in their stead because the wages of sin is death. So someone or something had to die in order for there to be remission of sins. The priest would then collect the blood of the animal and take that blood into the sanctuary and sprinkle it and put it on the horns of the Alt of incense. So the sin of the individual would now be in the blood of the animal because the life of the flesh is in the blood. We just read it. So the sins of individuals were then transferred into the sanctuary. So the sanctuary will then be defiled with a record of the Israelite sin. And on one day in every year, on the day of atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, the high priest would then cleanse the sanctuary of all the sins that had accumulated there throughout the year. And that is what the Day of Atonement is for. The cleansing of the sin of the sanctuary. So let us continue to, to see what transpired after the sanctuary was cleansed. Leviticus 16 verse 20 onwards says this, And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat, that's Azazel, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and notice what he's going to do, and confess over him all the iniquities, notice the plurality, all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away, that's the goat, by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And this will become clearer as I proceed in the presentation to explain what will happen and to see the sim symbolism of the goat being sent out into a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. So after the sanctuary was cleansed, Aaron would then come out of the sanctuary. He would place his hand upon the head of Azazel, the live goat, and confess all the sins of the children of Israel upon the head of the live goat. So he's now transferring the sins of the children of Israel from the sanctuary that, that had been built up throughout the year onto the head of the live goat. So the live goat will now bear the sins of the children of Israel. And then he, will, he was sent out into the wilderness, into a land that is not inhabited. Thus indicating that their sins have been removed from them. So that is the symbolism. And what God was doing here was to teach how he's dealing with the sin problem. And Jesus is currently doing that work in the heavenly sanctuary, which we'll explain a little later. So after the, the sins of the people were confessed over the head of the live goat, Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. So after the sanctuary was cleansed, the high priest would lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess the nation's sins thus symbolically transferring the sins to Azazel. And here you're seeing a picture of the high priest 
laying both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confessing the sins of the people unto the head of the goat, transferring their sins to the live goat. The live goat was then led away to bear the iniquities of the people to signify that their sins have been removed. However, even though Azazel, the live goat, bore the sins of the people, it was never sacrificed for sin, which is very important. The live goat was never sacrificed for sin. Azazel, the goat sent away to bear the sins of the people, represents Satan because he was the instigator and originator of sin and must ultimately bear the responsibility for his part in tempting humanity to sin. Notice Leviticus 16, verse 25 and 26. And the fat of the sin offering, which is Jehovah's goat, shall he burn upon the altar, and that's the altar of burnt offering. And he shall let go the goat for the scapegoat, shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward come into the camp. So this is referring to the man, the fit man, that would lead away Azazel into the wilderness. So notice that the man that led away Azazel also had to wash himself like the high priest did because they were in contact with the live goat who was now bearing the sin of the entire nation. So before they could come back into the camp, they had to wash themselves in water because they were in contact with the goat representing Satan. The sending away of Azazel Bearing the sins of the people signifies complete atonement and the total removal of sin from the presence of God and his people. Leviticus 16 verse 27 onwards says this, And the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place shall one carry forth without the camp. And they shall burn in the fire their skins and their flesh and their dung. And he that burneth them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterward he shall come into the camp. So notice what Leviticus 16 verse 29 to 34 continues to say. And this is telling us that the day of atonement was a yearly thing, an annual event. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day, the day of atonement, shall a priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before Jehovah. So the day of atonement was a day of cleansing the people of sins. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make the atonement. So only the high priest could make the atonement and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments. And he, the priest, the high priest, shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as Jehovah commanded Moses. So this chapter outlines the full details of what took place on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16. So throughout the year, viewers, the daily service of the sanctuary dealt with the cleansing of the sinner, the individual sinner, through the act of confession and repentance, which is what we are supposed to be doing right now. Because 1 John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when an individual sinned during the year, they would confess their sins by placing their hands on the head of the animal, thus symbolically transferring their sins to the innocent animal. The animal now bore the sins of the individual and would be slain by the sinner in the sinner's stead. The priest would then take the blood of the animal and put some of it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering. Therefore, sin entered the sanctuary through the blood of the animal and thus defiled the sanctuary, which is why it needed to be cleansed on the day of atonement, which took place on the 10th day of the seventh month. This process of transferring sin to the sanctuary is clearly documented in Leviticus chapter four. And I'll just read a portion of this chapter 
to show how sin was actually transferred into the sanctuary. You can read the entire chapter in your own time, but I'll just read a few verses just to show the process of transferring sin into the sanctuary. Sin could actually be transferred in another way by the priest eating the flesh of the animal that was slain after the sin was confessed over the animal in the holy place. So sin was brought into the sanctuary in two ways. One, by the priest taking the blood of the animal into the sanctuary and sprinkling it on the veil and placing it on the horns of the altar of incense or by eating the flesh of the animal. So notice what we are told in Leviticus chapter 4, which talks about the law of sin offerings. And Yehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of Yehovah concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, if the priest that is anointed do sin, so this is referring to the priest, so if the priest that is the high priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he had sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto Jehovah for a sin offering. And notice what he is supposed to do. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before Jehovah, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before Jehovah. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before Yehovah, before the veil of the sanctuary. And notice what he did also. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before Yehovah, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is outside in the courtyard, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And a similar thing also happened if the congregation as a whole sinned. And if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of Jehovah concerning things which should not be done and they are guilty, when the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring it before the tabernacle of the congregation. So this is for the entire nation. And the elders, the 12 tribal leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before Jehovah and confess the sins of the nation. And the bullock shall be killed before Jehovah. And the priest that is anointed shall bring of the bullock's blood to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in some of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before Jehovah, even before the veil. And he shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, which is before, the, before Jehovah, that is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour out all the blood at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So you can read the rest of the chapter, but that gives you one of the ways in which sins were transferred into the sanctuary. The priest would lay his hand upon the bullock, slay the bullock, take the blood inside the tabernacle, put it upon the horns of the altar of incense, and sprinkle it upon the veil that is before the, the altar. So that is how sin was transferred into the sanctuary which is why the sanctuary had to be cleansed because of all the sins that accumulated there throughout the year. So let's now make the link and show how Jesus Christ is currently fulfilling the Day of Atonement. The role of the high priest on the Day of Atonement served as a type of Jesus' ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. And notice Hebrews 7, verse 26 and 27. For such an high priest became us, speaking of Jesus, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And notice what he said of Jesus. Who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So the blood of Jehovah's goat used for the sin offering symbolized Jesus' shed blood. Notice Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 to 3. Now the things which we have spoken, this is a song coming from Hebrews chapter 7. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Notice this now. Whereof it is, necess 
where of it is of necessity that this man, speaking of Jesus, have somewhat also to offer. And what he had to offer was his own blood. For if he were on earth, Jesus should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. If he was on earth, he could not serve, because the priests on earth came from the tribe of Levi. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. But in the heavenly sanctuary, he serves as our high priest because he's from a different order. He's, his order is of the order of Melchizedek, whereas the Levitical priesthood was after the order of Aaron, who was the first high priest. So these high priests who served on earth serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, God saith unto him, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So viewers, the earthly sanctuary that was built by Moses in the wilderness was a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary which also needed to be cleansed. So there is indeed a sanctuary in heaven of which the one on earth was patterned. So everything that the high priest did in the earthly sanctuary was a type of what Jesus would do when he was to serve as our great high priest to make the ultimate atonement for our sins. So notice what we are also told, Hebrews chapter 9, and this chapter is very important to understand what was happening and why the sanctuary on earth was, was instructed to be built, the old and the new. Then verily, Hebrews 9 verse 1, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine services and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made. The first, wherein was the candlestick, and I showed you the picture of the sanctuary, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which is the most holy place, which had the golden censer, and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. So these were the three things that were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. So here again you are seeing a picture of the sanctuary. So this is the holy place where you have the candlesticks, the table of shewbread, the altar of incense, and you had the veil. And this is the most holy place which had the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid with gold. Now, when these things were thus ordained. The priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. So as I said earlier, the priest would go into the holy place, which is the first compartment, every day to minister on behalf of the people. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, which is on the day of atonement, which we are studying. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure, or it was a type, it was a shadow for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So the sanctuary on earth was constructed for a time to show the plan of salvation. And when Jesus died on the cross, that system of sacrifice came to an abrupt end. So there is no more need for an earthly sanctuary, but there is still a need for the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is currently ministering on our behalf. Because that is the true tabernacle which God pitched and not man. So notice what we are also told. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by what? His own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? shall the blood of Christ, so it is Christ's blood that is used to make an atonement, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he, Jesus, is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament or the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Jesus Christ is the testator and Jesus Christ died for our sins. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. The same thing happens. That is why before a person dies, they ought to make a, their last will and testament. As long as you're alive, that will cannot be probated. It is after the person who made the will has died that the will can be probated and the inheritance or legacy be given to those to whom it is to be entrusted. So Jesus is the mediator. He's the one that mediates the new covenant, which is why he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. So Jesus is the mediator. He is the one that gave his last will and testament. And after his death, he uses his blood to make an atonement for the sins of humanity. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats, which were symbolic of Jesus' blood, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, and notice, Moses at Mount Sinai said the same thing that Jesus said prior to his death in the upper room at the Last Supper. This is the blood of the testament which God had enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And notice these two verses. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission, which is why Jesus had to die as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens, in the heavenly sanctuary, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, because the blood that was used to purify the heavenly sanctuary was the blood of the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. But notice, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, just as the high priest entered into the most holy place in the earth of sanctuary in the presence of God to minister on behalf of the people of Israel back then. Jesus Christ is currently doing the same thing. He has now entered into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for us human beings. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year on the day of atonement with blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So he's cleansing sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment, which is why the day of atonement was a day of judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation because at the time of jesus second coming all sins would have been cleansed so viewers when we confess our sins on earth they are recorded in the sanctuary of heaven and that is why it is imperative for us to confess our sins now while jesus is doing the work of atonement on our behalf and it is jesus's blood that cleanses the sanctuary as he makes atonement for us before god the father so notice you are seeing this picture there's a person here on earth, on the continent of North America, praying and confessing his sins. And while he's praying, Jesus Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place, interceding and making atonement for the sinner. This is what we ought to be doing in this, the antitypical day of atonement that we are in right now. Judgment is taking place as I speak to you right now. So Jesus Christ is currently ministering as our great high priest in the sanctuary above. And this can be seen in the verses below. 
Notice Revelation 8, verse 3 and 4. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it to the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. Which is this throne. He had a golden censer. The, this angel in Revelation 8 is none other than Jesus Christ. Because only the high priest can minister before God in the most holy place. So this is the golden censer that you're seeing on the golden throne. The Ark of the Covenant was actually the throne of God. So what you're seeing here is what Revelation 8 verse 3 is talking about. The angel is offering incense with the prayers of the saints. So notice verse 4. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints, just as how you saw in the picture before, the person praying and his prayer ascending like incense. So as the person is praying, Jesus is now mingling his righteousness with the prayers of the saints to make it presentable before God the Father. So as he ministers, the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God the Father out of the angel's hands. Viewers, the antitypical day of atonement and the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven by Jesus Christ began in 1844. How do I know this? Because of the prophecy in Daniel 8, verse 13 and 14. Then I heard one saying speaking, this is Daniel, and another saying said unto him, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And the answer came, and he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. When speaking prophetically, a day is equal to a year. And this can be proven by looking at Numbers 14, verse 34, and Ezekiel 4, verse 6. So in essence, the answer was given unto 2,300 years, because a day is equal to a year. So 2,300 days is equivalent to 2,300 years. The starting point of the 2,300 years began in 457 BC, and this we know from Daniel 9, verse 25. When Daniel again was told, Know ye therefore from the going forth of the commandment to to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be 70 weeks, which is equal to 490 years. So the 2300 days started in 457 BC and from 457 BC to 2300 years in the future takes us to 1844. So 457 BC is when the decree or the commandment was given by Artaxerxes. Certain things were to be accomplished in 70 weeks. And this, these included the baptism of Jesus, which took place in AD 27, when Jesus started his public ministry. Three and a half years later, Jesus was crucified as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, which takes us to AD 31. Three years remained for the 70 weeks to be fulfilled. And it was fulfilled and came to an end when Stephen was stoned in AD 34. So 490 years out of the 2300 years had to do with from the time Jerusalem was restored and built until the stoning of Stephen in AD 34. So we have the starting point, which is 457 BC. 2300 years in the future takes us to 1844, which is when the sanctuary starts to be cleansed. That was the beginning of the investigative judgment which is what Jesus has been doing since 1844. So while the high priest was ministering on the Day of Atonement, no man was to be in the sanctuary because only confessed sins could be cleansed at this particular time. Notice what we are told again. Let us read the verse. Leviticus 16, verse 17. And we'll see the similarity of what will happen while Jesus is currently doing that work. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he, the high priest, goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. Notice now the similarity with the sanctuary in heaven. Revelation 15, verse 5 to 8. And after that, John was in vision. I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was open. 
And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And notice what happened here in verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So similarly, in the earthly sanctuary, on the day of atonement, no person was supposed to be physically in the tabernacle while the high priest was making atonement. Here, in the heavenly sanctuary, there's going to come a time when no man was no man will be able to enter into the temple. And I'll tell you why. So there's coming a time when no man will be able to enter into the heavenly sanctuary by confession and repentance because probation will be closed. And notice what we are told in Revelation 8 verse 5. This is speaking about the close of probation. And the angel took the censer because remember, on the day of atonement, the high priest had to bring incense into the most holy place to minister on behalf of the people. And the angel with Jesus took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. So he cast down the censer. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. This casting down of the censer signals the end of Jesus' work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary, which means that all cases have been decided when this verdict was rendered. And this verdict, John heard what will be said when probation closes. Revelation 22 verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Persons will be in those states after probation closes and Jesus ends his high priest work of atonement. After Jesus completes his work of atonement, no sin can be forgiven because the sanctuary would have already been cleansed. So it is imperative for us right now that when we sin, we confess our sins and so that they can be recorded in the heavenly sanctuary so Jesus can cleanse us from our sins and from all unrighteousness. So viewers, this is what Jesus is doing, and this is the antitype of what took place on earth back then in Israel on the Day of Atonement. The final antitype to the Day of Atonement is the transfer of the sins from the heavenly sanctuary to Azazel, which will ultimately be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. We are told what will happen. It has not yet happened, but John saw in vision what will happen and i saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and i want to pay keen attention to this verse satan will be cast into the bottomless pit and shut up and a seal will be set upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loose a little season. So remember, on the day of atonement in Israel, the high priest, after cleansing the sanctuary, would come out and lay hold on the live goat, placing his hand upon the head of the live goat and confessing the sins of the people upon the head of the live goat, thus transferring the sins to the live goat. The fulfillment of this is when the angel descends from heaven and lays hold on the dragon and Satan. And this is where the transference of sins take place. And the devil will now bear the sins of the world. So the devil will bear the sins of the world, but notice he does not, and I repeat, the devil does not atone for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ is the one that atoned for the sins of the world. Satan is guilty of causing sin, so he will ultimately face the consequence of his rebellion. On the Day of Atonement, Azazel, who was the live goat, was exiled to the wilderness in a land not inhabited. And the same will be true of the devil, because Azazel represents Satan. At the second coming, viewers, the earth will be returned to its pre-creation state, 
and become uninhabited. We all know these two verses, Genesis 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. I want you to pay attention to the earth being without form and being void, or in other words, being empty, and that darkness was upon the face of the deep. This word deep in the Hebrew is the same as the Greek word for bottomless pit, which is abusos, from which we get the word, the English word abyss. So the earth will return to the pre-creation state. It will be like an abyss, like a bottomless pit. Darkness will be returned to the earth. The earth will be void and the earth will be without form. So notice how this is fulfilled. God has told us all these things ahead of time so that we don't have to share the same faith as the devil. Notice Isaiah 24 tells us what will happen at the second coming of Jesus and how the earth will be like a wilderness and how it will be uninhabited. Behold, Jehovah make the earth empty so it will be void and make it waste and turn it upside down and scatter it abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for Jehovah had spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Why? Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned. People will be destroyed. They will be burned by the brightness of Jesus' coming. And few men left. These few men are the righteous who will be taken to heaven. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly because there will be a great earthquake. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard because of the earthquake and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that Jehovah shall punish the host of the high ones, these are the fallen angels that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth, these are human beings. And notice this verse, Isaiah 24 verse 22, which takes us back to Revelation 20 verse 3, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners, are gathered in the pit. Remember the bottomless pit where the devil will be cast and shall be shut up. Remember in Revelation 20 verse 3, the devil will be shut up in prison and after many days shall be visited. This many days is equivalent to the millennium, 1,000 years. Jeremiah 4, 23 and 25 also speaks about the second coming of Jesus and how the earth will return to its pre-creation state. And notice verse 23, which uses the same phrase as Genesis 1, verse 1. I'm giving you all these scriptures to make the point. Jeremiah said this, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. What did Genesis 1, verse 2 says? The earth was without form and void, and darkness upon the face of the deep. And notice what Jeremiah also said, and the heavens, and they had no light. At the creation, the earth was without form and void, and God said, let there be light. So, at the second coming, there will be no light. The heavens will be black. Verse 24 and 25 says this. Jeremiah continues to speak prophetically. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled because of the earthquake, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man. The earth will be emptied, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. Where was Azazel sent? Into the wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of Jehovah and by his fierce anger. For thus hath Jehovah said, the whole land shall be desolate. Desolate means empty. Yet I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black. Because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent. Neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken and not a man dwell therein. 
because the earth will be emptied. So viewers, the earth will become a wilderness and be Satan's prison for 1,000 years. The land will be uninhabited because no human beings will be alive on earth during the millennium. Notice what we are told in Jeremiah 25 verse 31 to 33. The, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For Jehovah at a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked. Notice it is the wicked that are being punished. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith Jehovah. Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. And notice this verse, verse 33. And the slain of Jehovah shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. So viewers, the dead in Christ and the righteous living will be caught up at the second coming to meet Jesus in the air, while the living wicked will be slain by the brightness of Jesus coming, and the wicked dead will remain in the graves until after the millennium. Therefore, the earth will be desolate, void, and uninhabited, which is precisely why the wicked dead will not be lamented. No one will be here to mourn for them. No one will be here to gather them nor bury them because no one is alive on earth except Satan and his angels. So viewers, this is what will happen after the Day of Atonement ceases in heaven. Jesus is currently interceding and making atonement for the sins of humanity, which is why it is imperative, it is important for us to confess our sins today so that our sins can be registered in the sanctuary of heaven and be cleansed and be atoned and that our sins can be placed upon Azazel, which represents Satan, because Satan, he is the originator, he was the instigator of sin. He will ultimately bear the blame for the sins of humanity because he was the one that led our first parent into sin. But notice, he, even though he bears the sin, he was not sacrificed for sin. Jesus paid the sacrifice for sin. The sins of humanity will be placed upon Satan because he is the originator. He is the one that caused sin and death to enter our planet. And as a result, he will pay the consequence for his rebellion against God and for leading mankind into sin and causing death in the world. So that is what happened on the Day of Atonement. I hope that this presentation was clear. I hope that you now understand the entire plan of salvation. What happened during the time of Israel with the sanctuary was a type God gave the children of Israel the sanctuary message to show the plan of salvation and to show how he is dealing with the sin problem. And ultimately, sin will be laid square at the feet of Satan and Satan will face the ultimate price for sin. But Jesus Christ is our scapegoat. He is the one who knew no sin. He was innocent and he took our sin upon himself and his blood makes atonement for our souls. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. May God continue to bless us as we confess our sins so that our sins can be blotted out while Jesus is ministering on our behalf before his Father in the heavenly sanctuary. Have yourselves a wonderful day.